Hello, everybody. Ako namaste. Ako namaste, guys. Yes. Ako namaste. So I'll have to put this first, Thomas. Just share. Yes. My that's right. Let's begin with a short prayer. Let's invoke, inhale and exhale, relax the body. Feel yourself in the presence of the teacher, the supreme being and the great teachers and masters of theosophy as well. To the supreme being, the divine father, divine mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chokok, sweet to Lord Maha Guruji Mele. To Buddha Kwanian, Buddha Sakyamuni, Gautama Buddha, to Lord Christ, Lord Yehoshua Bamiriam, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, to all the great beings, teachers, and masters of theosophy, to the angels and beings of knowledge, light, and power, to our soul and divine self, we humbly invoke for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, guidance, and greater understanding, greater and deeper and clearer understanding of these priceless teachings. To the angels and beings of communication, we ask you to help us to have proper connectivity, proper communication all through the session with reference to our respective Wi-Fi's. We ask the great beings to also help us to absorb and assimilate this knowledge, to simplify it so we may have a greater understanding, so we may become better instruments to help manifest your plan on earth and to become better divine instruments. We thank you for your tremendous light, for your tremendous patience, for your tremendous clarity. Thank you with gratitude, respect and love, we thank you. Right, we're going to go to the sympathetic nervous system. That's where we kind of uh, stopped the other day. So if you have your books, um, the e-books or your own uh, hard copies, let's open to the page. Right, so when we talk about the uh, sympathetic nervous system, we have to understand from last uh, session that was on Wednesday that this is directly connected to the astral body. Remember, it starts from there, starts from there, and through the vibrations actually pulls the physical form to create uh, what we call the nervous system. And so, uh, to understand uh, also at this point that the centers we're talking about are not the energy centers. To repeat ourselves, that uh, chakra that we usually refer to in in uh, healing and in other schools is something that's developed much later. It's not at this point that uh, these are even close to being present. So going back, so these centers that we're referring to, uh, they're also interestingly the centers from where actually organs will then get created in the physical form. And so they say that from these centers, uh, not chakras, yeah, 10 organs uh, in the physical form, right? Five of them, are with reference to what we call sense centers and five are with reference to motor centers, all situated and located in the brain. And so we talk about them with reference to the five senses which receive information. It's called the Gyanendras, yes, and they are what you call knowledge centers or let's simply put it as sense centers. And so the organs that are associated and connected with this is your eyes, your ears, yes, your uh, nose, your tongue, and your skin. So these are the sense organs through which they're able to then receive this energy. At the same time, uh, there are also those through which they convey um, through vibrations, yes, outwards to the outer world. And so those are called the karmendrias. 
Yes. And so this is what we call action senses or associated with our motor senses. So very simply put, we talk about the senses. So I'm going to just call them the sense centers. And the motor is with reference to movement. So it's your arms, your legs. Uh, it's with reference to your uh, larynx and organs of generation and excretion. So I would presume generation is uh, the reproductive organs as well. Now, uh, one of the things that they mention here uh, with reference to this is uh, when we're talking about the nervous system, the nervous system, remember when we spoke about it earlier, is situated all over the body. Yes, connected to practically every part. It helps. And remember, it was also one of those um, that has the prana or the energy channels or the no, nafi. Uh, okay, fine. Sorry. Yeah. I'll go to that in a bit. Okay. Um, so uh, I put up uh, the PowerPoint. So like Sumi said, you have five points to receive data and five points to express data or send out data. Uh, you have to understand these are just tools for the soul to manifest itself, right? Um, like we were talking about last time, you have these clusters being formed. Uh, which start to interact with the um, etheric body and uh, then clusters maybe in the mental body being formed, interacting with the etheric body and that forms the nerve cells. And so these clusters have the most um, concentrated contact with the, uh, uh, with the uh, physical body and the etheric body. And these clusters, now before we were told that they were starting from groups of matter, they grouped in, formed clusters, start absorbing and interacting. And these clusters are what develops into your sense, sense um, centers in your astral body and your mental body. All right. So you, have, you can imagine maybe 10 clusters all over your astral body and mental body. Those actually transform into your sense centers. That's what they... That's what I feel they're trying to tell you. Yeah. All right. So, so then um, that makes sense because that one has the most experience out of the whole body. It created the astral body, right? Through the, it started from there and expanded outwards. So, so that is a maximum, um, you know, experience you can say with interaction or the best communication link. And, you know, sometimes, um, based on what we've been thinking about the nervous system, we couldn't go into it last time because we ran out of time. We went way over time. Uh, but I find it really amazing sometimes. It gives you, uh, you know, how the whole, if this is true, of course, uh, how the whole nervous system is formed from one cell, slowly, patiently growing, growing, growing as, you know, years and years pass. And um, it gives you uh, a small glimpse of, uh, or a small perspective of what evolution is like. Like, can you imagine how long it took to create or verify? Uh, this corresponds to the third spirale and the fourth also, right? Can you imagine not being able to feel at all yourself? No nervous system, no feeling. Can you imagine how uh, evolved we are compared to that? All right, we just have an extra or two spirale and we're compared to uh, us compared to a carrot is just two spirales, right? So just think of a very lowly developed animal or a plant. Now, can you imagine what it would be like to have all seven spirales developed, right? Can you compare a person with all seven spirales developed looking at a person with only three or four spirales? It's like us looking at a carrot or a vegetable, <laughs> right? So, um, so the way we look at plants or animals, like, so I'm like, wow. Uh, and if you are really given a technique, right, the, um, that is like a super boost and would help you instead of this back and forth, going back and forth, which will help you accelerate through hundreds and thousands of years of evolution, if not millions of years. I remember once Masachu was saying, the technique given to you will, you know, what can be done in 20, 30 years would normally take thousands or millions of years. At that time, I was thinking, is it over exaggerating or what? A million years? I mean, that's a long time. We're going into dinosaur territory, you know? So, uh, you know, for, for me, when I would go to um, Europe and I would see uh, a painting that's 500 years old and you know, maybe a thousand years old, 1000, like 1000 BC, 1000 AD, I would be amazed. I'd be like, wow, this is thousand years old. Here he's talking about hundreds and thousands, not tens of thousands and millions of years. So, 
the techniques that these teachers teach, not only the not only in the Arhatic Yoga system, but all these highly developed yogis teach, um, are extremely potent. Um, as, you know, sometimes we're given these techniques, don't practice the technique or follow the instructions. It must be really frustrating for the for the highly developed teacher looking at us, probably like an animal or a vegetable. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, and sometimes the animal and vegetable pretend they know better than the <laughs> seven spirale or more developed teachers. My God, really, it's mind blowing. Anyway, I can go to the next one. Okay. By so, the way, sorry. Uh, when I was checking it, I was reading up on it. Um, that's why when you're interacting with your nervous system, you automatically, for example, if somebody, if you're in a for example, in a class, you know that the teacher is going to hear you. So you automatically, emotionally, there's an emotional response and you tend to whisper. You tend to whisper to your uh, classmate, especially if you don't want the teacher to hear. So that whispering uses the nervous system to manipulate the, what, what part? The, um, the larynx. <laughs> so, so all that is connected to the mental body and emotional body. You're thinking, you know what's going to happen. You're feeling, you don't want them to find out, and then you do it. All right. I, I just uh, had one more um, inside of this point when you were talking, uh, is that if you understand if these are the centers that actually do come from the astral point, which means that the emotions do play a big role in our senses, it's not just our brain, uh, those various uh, sense points, but also the organs that are connected to those sense points. And so that's why when you get upset, when you get excited, the, the, the body parts, yes, even, even without considering the chakras, are already responding and reacting to it and changes. Uh, whether it's the health of the organ, yes, um, whether it's the functioning of the organ, it does change. So I thought that was interesting because at this point, we're not even talking about chakras existing, but just these organs that do come from this point. And I realized, wow, you know, even at that uh, initial uh, stage of evolution, this connection is already there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to move on, then we're talking now about um, the nervous system all over. And then we talk about, remember the, the meridian or the nadis that follow almost close to that, literally uh, along with it, allowing the prana then to spread to the entire etheric or energy body. Right. And so they say that is one aspect that is prana. Yes. But they also say separate from this, <clears throat> there is also what you call the man's magnetism <clears throat> or the nerve, nerve, <clears throat> excuse me, nerve fluid. Right. And they say this is generated or originates within his own body. And uh, this is the one part where I had a discussion with Amit. And so both of us uh, understand that this is probably from within you, the incarnated soul, which actually has what you call the architecture. Yes, the way the physical body should look and also the energy body. So even the structure of the energy body, how the nadis would be, where it would be and how it would go along with the uh, nerves is already set in that seed. And so the entire architectural plan for also the nervous system is from there. And it's just not a plan saying, okay, fine, this is what you'll have to do. But it emits this power or this force that continues to keep this shape as it's supposed to be. It doesn't change. It doesn't move. That's how it's supposed to be, just like our physical form is supposed to be. The energy body also has a certain form and shape, and it continues to see to it that it maintains. Because Master Chua says that prana is much more subtle than perfume. And if you open a perfume bottle, there goes all the perfume in a couple of hours. However, for you and me, uh, we realize our prana doesn't just disappear. I mean, even when we uh, send energy to someone, we have to stabilize it. But how come even without stabilizing, this prana continues to remain within our energy body, right? So it was one of the questions he asked me, I remember a long time ago in a restaurant. So it's basically, if I could put it this way, the soul energy that emits uh, and that comes down, first of all, from your higher soul and emits from this, this seed that kind of maintains this. And so that's what they're talking about. And so they also mention here, uh, more accurately put that along a coating of ether, which surrounds, which surrounds each nerve. Yes. So it, it's supposed to be along with every nerve. And then they compare it to how blood goes through the vein in the body. Uh, and 
the blood just doesn't only move through the veins, but it actually carries something very important for this physical body, which is oxygen. And so the nerves, right, uh, through this nerve fluid, this, this energy that keeps it, actually helps then, uh, as the word comes here, conveys prana through the entire energy body or allows it to circulate throughout the energy body. Okay. So... <clears throat> It says the student must carefully note that the prana which courses along the nerves is quite separate from the, and distinct from what is called the man's magnetism, right? Now this, uh, what I feel, this nerve fluid, as they call magnetism, you see the incarnate soul sometimes or higher soul in oneness is known as animal magnetism sometimes. The, 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 the yes. terms are very, very confusing. Masichua said it has nothing to do with animal and nothing to do with magnets. So sometimes the terms are confusing. What I feel they're talking about is the energy, the life energy that comes through the, um, the, the, the life cord and emits out of the physical permanency. For those of you who you've re who've read the Achieving Oneness with the Higher Soul book, uh, emits out of the um, physical permanency and helps integrate and hold everything in place. Um, why do I think that? Why do I think it's that, the, the nerve fluid? That's because, number one, it's generated within the body in terms as it emanates from within the body outwards, radiates outwards and holds everything together. Number two, um, the nerve fluid or magnetism keeps the etheric matter circulating along the nerves. So it keeps etheric matter from circulating around the nerves, right? So how does it keep that? Um, or more accurately, along the coating of ether which surrounds each nerve, much as blood circulates to wind. So they're talking about the bioplasmic uh, channels or the nadis, but this nerve fluid helps keep the shape of these nadis and bioplasmic uh, channels. All right, because, oh, anyway, electricity <laughs> the electricity is gone. <laughs> so otherwise, what's gonna happen is, um, what what will happen is the, 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 the channels are made of energy. So that energy will lose shape, you know, the, the energy will, um, uh, will just disintegrate. So what keeps it together is the sat or the existence or the, the, the prana flowing through it, right? What else does it say? Uh, where are you? Okay, so, so it says here. This part? Yeah, along the coating of each other. And just as blood carries oxygen to the vein, so does the nerve fluid convey prana. So it is through this nerve fluid uh, or these bioplasmic channels that Prana is conveyed, but they're using the two um, interchangeably. There are two factors. There's the prana, which flows through the nerve fluid. There's actually the bioplasmic channel. And then there's the third component that holds the bioplasmic channel in place, which is your uh, life energy coming out of your physical permanency. Um, and the bioplasmic channel is, of course, spoken about in the Miracle Supranic Team book, where Master Chouas talks about it. And then we have to skip the next part, right? For the Yes, so uh, we're going to be talking about how, you know, just like in the physical body, the cells are replaced, uh, particles in the physical body, as they call it, are replaced constantly. We know that we have dead cells, but there are always new cells being regenerated. However, the source or nourishment for this comes from the food we take in, yes, the air that we breathe in, the water that we drink, correct? At the same time, they say even the etheric body is similar. Right, it is constantly changing, which means even the etheric particles are constantly being replaced. And so they say that this again is uh, done with the food that we take in, the air that we breathe, right, uh, and the prana. And uh, then we come. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Correct. No, I'm just talking yeah, yeah. about that. And then we come to something called vitality globules. We'll come to vitality globules in a in a bit. And so we're going to move into. Uh, go ahead. Um. So. So this is very simple. Most of you who are pranic healers know this. Um, you know that the physical body are, is constantly changing. Cells are dying. Cells are being created. And uh, you can look at yeah. And then the of course there's constantly change with the etheric particles as well. And how does the body get this etheric particles? is from food, breathing, and through the vitality globule. The, the concept through the vitality globule, they've not ex explained how the mechanism is. Maybe that'll come later in the yes, chapter. Yes, in the next chapter. Uh, but you have to realize that air prana, uh, so when they say breathing, air prana is already uh, absorbed. You don't even absorb it only from the spleen, for those of your prana healers. You also absorb it through the lungs. 
according to the, if you read the medical supranic lung book, it'll, it'll explain that. Air prana is absorbed through the lungs, through breathing, and it's also absorbed directly from the NG centers. And these NG centers are, of course, called chakras. And more, you know, and, and it's also be, it, it can also be absorbed directly through the skin by people who've undergone certain training. All right, so that talks about how the body gets nutrients. We've put into quotes there. So men and animals obtain prana from sunlight, air, ground, water, and food. So it's uh, saying almost the same thing. All right. So we're going to move to the next part. Now here we're going away from all this, uh, you know, the nerves and the body and stuff. So we're going That's actually, yeah, so we're done with the physical form and the energy form. We're going to actually try and understand what prana is. And so they say that prana or vitality exists on all planes. So every plane that we talk about, physical, astral, mental, etc. However, in this particular part that we're going to be referring to, we're going to only refer to the physical plane. And in the physical plane, we're going to only work on the lowest, right? So just want to make that very clear. That's basically what they're saying there. And it says that uh, it must be noted that prana on the physical plane is sevenfold. That is, there are seven varieties of it. And uh, we... We have seen already that is quite separate and distinct from light, heat, and other forms because it's got nothing to do with forehead. But it's actually the second force that comes down, which is prana. Right? Do you want to talk no, about that? I'll, I'll, I'll keep, I'll talk. All right. So its manifestation with reference to uh, the physical plane appears and depends. It appears that it depends on sunlight. Though it does not have anything to do with forehead, the light that they're talking about there, it does have a, a great impact when there is sufficient sunlight in our presence. So when the sunlight is increased, right, there is abundance, you're having a nice, lovely, sunny day. Then they say that the prana also seems to increase. Yes? Uh, no. And then uh, where sunlight is absent, for example, uh, when you go sometimes to the northern part of uh, our continent or even into Europe, you'll notice that when there's no sunlight, then the prana also gets, uh, uh, it, it's not sufficient. It, it, it reduces and that affects people because you and I realize now that prana is very important for our sustenance, sustenance of this physical form. And so when it starts to decrease, um, for example, when we have monsoons here and it's cloudy for many, many days, it can reduce. Right. And so having sunny days, the bright sun actually makes a difference. And you will notice that when the sun comes out, people are also different. It's not just because the sun is out, but it's also because the, the quantity, uh, not just the quality, but the quantity of the air prana um, also is increased. Do you want me to stop there? And then we'll come back. Yeah, we were supposed to talk about that first. Oh, that's what I asked you. That's what you wanted me to do. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so what does it say here? It says, so prana and vitality exists on yeah. all planes. Um, and that's what I said. It's just on the lowest plane that we're talking about. Okay. So the name to which are attached the seven spokes uh, of the universal wheel. Wheel. wheel, yeah. wheel. So it's basically saying the prana is in the center of all seven planes. All of it uses prana. And that's what I think. And it says... Um, uh, the appearances and the methods of the work of the lowest physical plane. Uh, so we're looking at, it must be noted that prana on the physical plane is sevenfold. There are seven varieties of it. All right. So, um, all right. So we noticed that, right? So does it talk about the sun yet? Yeah. Where? Just the sunlight, not the sun. Oh, okay. So, Ah, the prana, the one life. So basically, we learned in the earlier part of this chapter that everything comes from the sun, right? The three forces, all right? Yeah, they talk about the three forces. Uh, and we've observed this, right? If you look at uh, during morning when the sun is out, it, it's less cloudy. It almost feels uh, cheerful and invigorating when the sun is really out. There's less clouds, the blue sky. Um, and compared to when there's barely any much sunshine, all right? That is because, as mentioned in the beginning of the chapter, the sun pours out three forces into the entire solar system. All right? One of them being prana or vitality. 
right? Physically, we are aware, of course, that the sun provides heat and light to the earth, without which life would not be possible, all right? If you do not have heat from the sun, you do not have light from the sun, life would not be possible, all right? Now, we learn energetically, the sun also provides prana or vitality, without which, um, of course, like I said, life would not survive on earth. With spirituality, you have to remember that always the higher principle, all right, always remember the higher principle, what we spoke about, um, encompasses the lower principle. You have the physical body, more subtle than that is the energy body, all right? So the etherical, etheric particles encompass and interpenetrate the entire physical body, okay? Um, the energy form, the solar logos is obviously um, much, much more subtle, all right? And so it interpenetrates all the levels. This pranic energy or this vitality, all right, it penetrates all the la layers and all the levels of um, our planes, okay? And that's why it's, um, that's why it's, um, it's like the center of everything, okay? So it manifests on each plane. But here, we're only interested, what he's trying to say is we're only interested with the prana on the physical plane. All right, not the astral prana uh, uh, or emotional prana, mental prana, and all those things. Now, in the beginning of the chapter, all right, um, it says that the solar logo sends forth three types of energy. All right, I've mentioned this twice now. I, you have to keep in mind, I don't remember it saying that there were only three energies. Okay, it just mentions that there are three energies. Always remember there are different levels of truth. Um, it actually mentions that right now we are aware of only three. There might be others, but right now they are aware of only three forces. Okay. So just like there were seven chakras before, there might be more. But here in our scheme of evolution, they feel that three is maybe enough or maybe there are only three. And now it says there are seven varieties of it, right? So it says... Um, um, so prana on the physical plane is sevenfold. This there are seven varieties of it, all right? Uh, this is in Advanced Pranic Healing Book when white prana, all right, or prana on the physical plane is composed of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet pranas. Actually, for some reason, uh, indigo is missing, but, but for some reason, when experiments were done, as far as I understand from Masachoa, uh, indigo doesn't stay in the body. The moment indigo comes in, it tends to disappear. It's only been noticed in people who are quite developed, all right, but based on the teachings of uh, based, based on what Master told us, if prana, if indigo prana were to be projected on a patient, the part would get weaker, it would not get stronger. It has a weakening effect. It's probably like dark violet. All right. So uh, normally we don't see it if it comes in the body. So it's there. It, it is there. Indigo is there, but it just comes and it's gone. Except in people who are quite developed. Should I go? Yeah. <laughs> I already spoke about the sun, that's why. What do you want me to do? Sun? You continue, I'll talk about the whole thing. All the right. sun, I'm talking about later. So, yeah. so do we talk about the atom first and then we go to the sun? That will automatically come in page 19. They talk about a lot here. The sun, right? Okay. The sun's effect. All right, so um, what we'll do is from here, we're going to just jump a little bit. Uh, we're going to come to the atom, right? And so we're talking about atom in the sense of the physical atom that you and I all have and that surrounds us as well. So when you look at the physical atom, in those days, the atom was the smallest particle they had already discovered. Right now we have quarks, but that wasn't what they're referring to. It's the actual atom that we physically talk about. So they say that every atom has two types of forces that uh, are, uh, that kind of affect it and uh, these two forces, one they say is the will, uh, will force of the logos. And they say that the will force emanates from the third aspect. And so there's a bit of um, uh, lack of clarity for us because will is something else, third aspect is something else for us. So anyway, the first one is the will force. And the second one, uh, sorry, the will force that we're talking about is the one that actually holds this atom in its proper shape. Yes, so maintaining the shape of that atom is basically the um, energy from the third aspect, which is a will force, they say. And then they say there's another uh, force as well, which is called the pranic force. It is important to note that the prana comes from the second aspect. Yes, the second aspect of the solar god. 
whereas the will force which I said comes from the third aspect and so we have the diagram here showing now interestingly when we talk about the atom and we talk about these forces the force is not something that comes from outside of the atom interestingly it comes from a different dimension which is the fourth dimension and it comes uh, clairvoyantly seen comes from within the atom so this force looks like it is coming from within the atom and uh, doing <laughs> and affecting the atom accordingly, right? And so that uh, is the image that you can see here. So you find that there are these two energies, these two forces that are constantly there within the atom. And so it says the effect of prana on atoms is entirely different from that of electricity. So they say when electricity kind of goes through uh, an atom, <clears throat> it deflects it and, and, <clears throat> and holds them in a certain way, right? Uh, but for me, the whole point is when you look at what they're talking about, the effect of any of them, whether it's electricity or heat or whatever, that is uh, in reference to Fohar, the effect of this kind of uh, force is from the outside. It's not unlike the first two that we referred to, that comes from within. And that, that for me was a major difference between anything that affects the uh, atom from outside, that is completely different from the two forces that we're talking about, that actually comes from within it, uh, affecting it continuously. And so you and I, uh, as students of uh, occultism, they say we should be familiar with the shape and structure of the so-called atom, the physical atom that we refer to, which is at that point the smallest particle that they had found on the physical plane. And so based on the combination, now my chemistry hasn't been so great and I don't think I remember this. So they're talking about how the shape is uh, with reference to uh, combination into liquid, into gas, into uh, solids. And uh, the shape is basically a heart with uh, someone beat the head and beat the butt. Or not the butt, the foot. Oh, really? It's a little it's... bit flat on top, flat at the bottom. And then those are the whirls and all that they're talking about. So. Are you talking about real life? No, no, no. Occult chemistry. Occult chemistry. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I thought maybe in real it's life. It's the ultimate something... physical atom. <laughs> yeah, correct. That's so... why it's like a little heart shape, but it's a little flat on top, which gives it that. And the bottom is actually also a little bit flat. All right. So. Do you want me to continue or you, you talk um, at all? You talk about, yeah, you can, um, no, not the hyper meta. Okay. Yeah, so then okay, so I, I'm just going to make it very simple because I, I got a little confused reading this. It's, it's, it's anyway, let's just, uh, <laughs> let's just see how. So basically they want to explain two things. One thing is, how is the atom or how is the unit of prana made, all right? Um, and even atoms will have a corresponding etheric uh, counterpart. So how is the uh, unit of prana made? And how is um, the vitality globule made? Those are the two things we want to know, right? And then later on in the next chapters, we're going to see how is the vitality globule used. But here too is how is the uh, unit made? Then what is the vitality globule about? And then what affects the vitality globule? These three. I think that's the rest of the chapter to sum it up. So on the physical plane, what they're saying is prana enters the molecules. Makes sense, right? Prana enters the molecules. It's more subtle, so it can enter. Um, but then it doesn't enter from outside. We'll come to that. Um, and due to its energy, prana is energy, it's vitality, right? It, it, since it vitalizes them, it enlivens them, it makes them glow bigger or grow brighter. Okay? That's what happens on the physical plane. Now, although this might seem similar to the way electricity works, it comes from, um, you see, Electricity works the same way if you look at it. In, in, in the book or in, in Theosophy, they say prana enters the molecule and um, it enlivens it and becomes bright. The bulb, you know, if you look at electricity, that works the same way. You get from the main source, from say here it's coming from the solar locus, say the main source, the main power transformer, it keeps getting stepped down uh, and enters the house, enters the physical plane through a wire. In increases the energy, enlivens the bulb, the bulb grows brighter. All right, but it's not the same mechanism with which it works. So although the effect might look the same, ah, both the bulb grows brighter and also the uh, atom grows brighter. The way the electricity affects atom energetically, according to theosophically, uh, theosophy, is that when it enters from outside into the atom, it makes the atom uh, reverberate or oscillate very, very fast compared to the size of the atom. So that's the effect electricity has on the atoms. All right, but the way prana works is it does not come from outside. 
all right? In the sense that when they saw that the atom was being filled up, there was no force from outside acting on it. So obviously the conclusion is that if it's not from outside, it must be coming from inside, to, but through a different dimension, which they cannot see or maybe they saw and they didn't write about a fourth dimension, okay? You think of a light bulb, think of a light bulb. When it's on, you know that the source is from outside, since you can see the wire leading to the bulb, right? But imagine the bulb is floating in the air and it's lit up, all right? Filled with energy instead of light, all right? Where did, the, where did that light or prana come from? If it's not from outside, there's no wire, it should be from inside from, or somewhere from an internal source, right? The second question, so that is what they're trying to say. It's not from outside, it comes from inside. The second question is, um, how did the bulb, right, which is the container for the energy, the bulb is basically a container for the energy, right? How did the bulb retain its shape, right? You talked about that, right? How did the bulb retain the shape, okay? Um, and what is keeping the bulb, or now you can say, how is the bubble retaining shape? How come, doesn't it, how come it doesn't collapse? You have to understand it's made of energy, right? The shape, uh, according to the book, is maintained through intention. Whose intention? The intention of the logos, or you can say the will of the logos, all right? As we mentioned before, the energy of the logos is interpenetrating everything, all right? And um, one of the aspects of this energy maintains the shape of all matter, all right? Because energy, it's like, you know, if you, if you boil water, the steam just dissipates. And prana, which is much, much more subtle than steam, how come that bubble or that bulb maintains the, or that container maintains the shape? Is because of intention, all right? Okay, so now, since we know that the, um, now, with, now, even for a second, so, since it interprets everything, even for a second, if the intention is withdrawn, all right, all the atoms would just lose shape and collapse and all the prana would come out, all right? Now, since we know that the shape of all atoms is held in place with the will of the logo, then this energy must travel through a channel or an energy network. If it has to exercise will, there has to be a channel for it to exercise its will. If it has to come from the third aspect or the first aspect, whatever aspect, from there to the interpenetrating, there has to be a sort of channel or energy network. And it is probably through that same network, I'm guessing, that the prana flows through because it comes from the logos, the intention comes from the logos, and from the prana, the prana comes from the logos. Through that energy network that it comes through, keeps the shape and fills it. All right? And that we can see in a quote that I wanted to show you. Um, in the hidden side of things, it talks about this, the truth with regard to other force, which we call vitality. So it enters the atom from within, along with the force that holds the atom together. So if, the, if, if what I understand is correct, based on the English that is the way it's written, it says um, the vitality, the force which we call vitality, enters the atom from within. We know that because you can't see anything outside along with the force that holds the atom together, all right? Um, instead of acting upon it entirely from without, that means outside, so as do other varieties, okay, so that we know. All right, so that, now the next question I was asking is, uh, can uh, the logos hold the shape of so many molecules at one time? Of course it can, it's the logos. We cannot comprehend what they can do and what they cannot do, or what the being can do and what the being cannot do. It's the solar god. And then I was uh, looking at the principle of controllability where Masachua says life force and disease energy or any energy can be controlled and directed through the will or through mind intent. That is why if you look at, there's an experiment in the basic primary killing book where you create a ball of energy, uh, three energy balls to, uh, to um, confirm the effect or to validate the effect of stabilizing. So Masachua asks you create a ball energy uh, project the prana, visualize it forming a, shape, a ball shape. And in one, you just don't do anything. In the second one, you stabilize, all right? And third one, he asks you to do something. Uh, but the question is, can you make a prana in the shape of a ball? Yes, you can, <laughs> all right? So if you can do it, the solar logos can do it. <laughs> all right. Now, so that's how the atom is made. 
basically the shape, the containers made through intent, the prana is sent through from the solar logos through that channel with which it's created and fills up the atom from within. All right, so if you look from outside, there's no energy source. It comes through a different, probably spirale of some energy network that we're not aware of. So now we look at how does this atom get converted or uh, changes into a vitality globule. That's what. All right. So now you have this uh, prana, and then they say that there are atoms in the atmosphere. And so when this prana decides to come from the solar logos, from the sun, towards these atoms that are there uh, in the atmosphere, it, based on what we already know, right, um, once it's charged with this um, energy, it has the ability now, it has like additional life, and it has the ability now to attract around itself six more atoms. Yes, and so uh, in occult chemistry, they call it the hyper meta proto element. Yes, just to make it nice and complicated here. Uh, it's, it, it's a combination of matter on the subatomic subplane. So uh, how, how is this different? Now, this is different from all others that we have observed because the energy that comes in here is actually the second aspect, right? The second aspect of the logos is the one that now comes in to help keep these six around the central atom. So keeping and holding it in place is from the energy or the will or the force of the second aspect, if I can put it that way. Right. And so this then forms what is called a vitality globule that you and I understand in pranic healing. That's absorbed that uh, Amit referred to earlier by the spleen or the crown or your breathing into your lungs or through the pores of the skin. So this is basically what happens. And so uh, this little group, uh, it becomes really brilliant. And they say that uh, this this part is the one that's also part of chemistry with reference to the male uh, or the positive snake in the in the chemical element of oxygen and is the heart of the central globe of radium. Like I said, my chemistry is quite bad, so I can't really uh, relate to that. But if someone else does, please share with us. Right. Uh, so basically, these globules then become super brilliant, really, really bright. And um, and if one based on what we do in, in the basic pranic healing class. So Master Joe says, this is something, and even the book says, it's something that you can actually see with your naked eye, as long as you're staring and doing that little exercise that we do. So you find a patch uh, in the sky where there are no clouds. Uh, it's a clear sky with the sun behind you. You angle your gaze at about 45 degrees uh, and stop your gaze about one meter away. And then if you just focus at that point, you will see these vitality globules. Uh, if you're very bored in the aircraft and there's nothing else to do, um, you know, the person next to you is asleep, you don't, you forgot to bring a book, just look outside the window and you will see again the vitality globules. That's whenever the aircraft start to fly around. Um, and, and if somebody to... actually sits next to you. <laughs> yeah, if you're allowed to have someone. Otherwise, just look outside the window, you probably see them. And it's amazing when you see it out there because the sun is usually quite bright. Uh, you'll find them moving in a very random fashion all around. And that is a vitality globule that we're talking about. So it's basically one, yes, uh, it gets this energy that we already spoke about. It attracts around it six others, yes, which is again maintained by the second aspect of the logos. And then that's the one that we all absorb. absorb. And they are very, 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 very bright. Now, I don't know if, uh, I think, I don't know if the Acharyas or who was telling us, but they, they were also mentioning that sometimes when you look out there, especially in, in cities that are polluted, the globules are not so bright mm. as compared to when you go outside. So it looks like, uh, you know, they do get affected by the state uh, of, of the physical form as well, the physical plane, whether it's physically uh, clean or um, energetically clean it's, it seems to affect them that's that's what i understand all goes. i'll come back to this later mm, okay we need to wrap up well yeah um so the what they're trying to say is uh when this vitality we were at the atom right so when this vitality enters the atom right from the fourth dimension from the solar logos it increases its life force tremendously all right um and it increases the amount of energy within it tremendously and it becomes, once it increases the energy of this atom so much, it becomes like a magnet which pulls in similar atoms 
and starts to arrange it in a structured form, all right? Which in theosophy, they call the hypermeta proto element. So basically matter from the subatomic plane. All right. The force which enables these atoms to group together and then stay together comes from the second aspect of the solar logos or the love aspect of the solar god. Okay. There's a saying in energy, uh, and I don't know whether this is connected to this because um, it says, um, and it's a well-known concept in uh, the course um, Psychic Practical Psychic Self-Defense by Master Jong Um It says, like attracts like. Okay. A person who likes to dance will hang out with people who like to dance. A person who is spiritual cannot connect with uh, connect, connect properly with people who for some reason are not spiritual. Uh, the way they approach certain subjects uh, would be different and matters are not the same. So they prefer to hack out people who are spiritual. All right? People who play golf like to hang out with people who play golf. Um, in a negative sense, this principle is also true. It's, in Science elements, it's called the boomerang effect. Okay, and that's why it increases as it goes back because on the way back, since it's negative, it attracts all sorts of things from the inner world, but then it goes back down much more stronger. So here, what they're saying is an atom is infused with so much vitality, all right, uh, an atom is infused with so much vitality that it starts to attract similar atoms towards it and combines to form a vitality globule. My understanding is since the law of attraction applies here, it has to be the force of energy of the love aspect of God. So that's why it's connected to the second. It's attraction, it's magnetism, so it attracts. So it has to do with the love aspect of God. Until in the <laughs> book by Ledbetter, if by Bishop Ledbetter, the book Chakras, I read that this force is now from the first logo, so it's confusing because uh, <laughs> now there are core contradictions. Um, I would think that the atom is caused by the first logos because if you understand the life energy that comes to us through our life cord has a similar effect. It holds all the uh, etheric particles together, same like the uh, energy that comes from the solar logos and holds the globules together uh, or the atoms together. So, and that one, according to Master Chua, is the first, uh, uh, first uh, aspect or the will or the sat or the existence. Uh, energy, but according to the book, it is uh, the third aspect. So we have to think about it. All right. So uh, now the question is, why six? There are six atoms. It's a total of seven. The the one that uh, uh, attracts, so it attracts six and then seven. And there are seven. Uh, so now, who the why six? Who knows? <laughs> okay, who knows? Uh, it's a total of seven. Maybe, maybe if I can, you know, just simulate a guess. Maybe there are seven colors which can be attracted, uh, extracted out of this vitality globule, as we know in pranic healing, um, which are used for healing, uh, six of which are used for healing. So maybe this has to do with that. <clears throat> seven is the number for uh, uh, manifestation. Who knows? <laughs> but it's arranged in a certain structured manner. It has a, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a um, blueprint to it. Okay, it's not random. And this structured manner and the force and it remains in that manner through the uh, second aspect according to the according to them okay so so we can go to the next one yeah so now uh, what we're looking at sure. is uh, the vitality globules yes the existence and its exuberance uh, does depend on sunlight and so they say here that when there is good sunshine, the, the, the power of uh, manifestation, yes, increases. So it says here very clearly, nevertheless, appears to depend upon light for the power of manifestation. And so sunlight is very vital for our vitality globules as well. And so uh, it says that whether you, you look at, just let's look at the day, so as the sun starts to rise, the amount of prana around is more. And as the sun starts to go down, more, more or less uh, towards the night, it says that it actually starts to diminish, right? Um, now, the number of globules formed will start to kind of get more or less stagnant as the night comes in. And so they say that the wee hours, you know, the early hours in the morning, basically you, you are surviving on the prana that was created the previous day. There's no extra prana that's been created now. And then again, as the sun comes, it starts to manifest. 
Now, this is very important, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for our health, both our physical health and, our, and the sustenance of life. And so they say that that's one of the reasons, according to them, that it's in those we hours in the morning that you have the maximum number of physical death because of the lack of this prana in, in the atmosphere. At the same time, if you have had days of cloudy, uh, cloudy weather for a while, then overall, the amount of prana in the atmosphere will also start to reduce. And probably that's one of the reasons why people do get depressed. Yes, uh, when they have uh, winter going on for a very, very long time, plus cloudy weather or um, weather where there is no sun, that does affect the physical body, emotional body and mental body. So prana is very, very important. And so they're trying to help us understand this. And so that is with reference to the day, it's reference uh, to cloudy days and others, and also with reference to the seasons that we have. So in summer, there's obviously more, and in winter, there is less. Yes, so it's in the day, uh, it's with a long number of days that are cloudy, and then of course the uh, seasons that we have. Okay, all or, this physical elemental will come in the next chapter, so. Yes, and so one of the things that they also tell us is uh, that the body requires this, and so, during the day, uh, when we are awake, they say that the, uh, the nerves and the muscles tend to become tense. But it's when we actually rest and sleep that the body actually starts to assimilate more prana. And that's why they say when you have like, you know, a little nap, even if it's a very short one, or you take a one hour long nap, you actually feel more revitalized and energized because your body has actually had the opportunity to absorb more prana into your system. Yes, and uh, what else do I want to add here? And so they say that prana uh, is poured forth not only on the physical, but also on the emotional, intellect, and spiritual. And uh, so they say that when you have sufficient prana, uh, where you have the right feeling and you have the and a clear thought, they said reacts on a physical, sorry, um, I, I need to read this whole thing for you. Yeah, of course. If you sleep and you don't get enough rest, then obviously you wake up irritated. You Correct. Have good rest. So it's if you've normal. had, uh, it says here, if you had good sunshine, right? You've had a clear day. Uh, the amount of sunshine out there has helped you. Then it says it oh, may... Oh, session. We have to stop. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for reminding me about that. So uh, we are more or less done for this. Uh, we just need to end with this part saying that uh, this vitality globule uh, helps you also think better, feel better, and therefore maintaining both physical health, emotional, and mental health. That's basically what I wanted to say. Maybe we'll continue this next time. We'll finish it off just in five minutes next time. It won't take another minute. Maybe. Yeah, okay. So, like five minutes right. Five so, it's already uh, 26. Yep. So, we'll... I'm almost done. We're just almost done. This uh, the, the next chapter It's almost um, almost done. So hopefully you enjoyed the session. We have Sri Ram session coming up, so we don't want to take any more time. Yes. Um, so please go enjoy. Uh, oh, wow. There are so many questions. Oh, uh, people is different depending on genetics. Right. For those of you who need to leave, uh, not a problem. Please say your Thanksgiving and you may leave. Uh, we just answer these questions. Uh, so it's at least saved in the live uh, session and you can always come back and look at the recording if you like. Certain groups of people are pleased. Is there something similar in the etheric body and mental body? For appearance of people, depending on your genetics, uh, Sriram, uh, I think you should read the book Achieving Oneness with the Eye Soul. Genetics just gives you the raw material, but choosing what material is chosen between the father and mother actually comes from the physical permanent seed. It contains a blueprint of the body. Yeah. Because between the, uh, the, the DNA between the father and mother, there are almost infinite permutations and combinations. Uh, I have certain jokes about that because in Dubai, you know, one of my friends, she's uh, Parsi and her brother, when he was born, came out a redhead and they all have black hair. So, so the father and there are a lot of Britishers in Dubai, right? So my father is like, this is not my baby. This is my baby. It's got redhead. So uh, although the father and mother had, you know, black hair, uh, the baby came out redheaded. Anyway, um, Predisposition to certain diseases also depending on your karma. Uh, that is different from what we're talking about today. Today I was observing airplane. It seemed that 
four to five move in a particular way and get merged with the size and then change. Are uh, vital rules such? Yeah, they can probably bump into each other, I guess, if they're moving haphazard. Like I said, I don't know whether they're moving in a network or whether they're moving haphazardly. All right, so uh, in this and prana healing, while projecting color, prana does the same color prana reach the patient? What medium being used to while projecting prana using different hand chakra technique? Uh, do they move slow or fast depending on your intention? It depends on your intention. It can be more penetrating, it can be less penetrating, it can be superficial depending on your intention. The medium that's used is the Earth's energy body, um, using both your etheric bodies connected to the Earth's energy body. That's what I understand, right? What he's asking. Yeah. That's how it reaches. Uh, and it's uh, using the ectoplasmic factor, <laughs> the cords. So your etheric body stretches out and connects via the medium of the etheric body of the earth to the patient. And then the healing happens. Not only from the solar plexus, but also from where you're projecting sometimes even the hand. That's why contamination is in depth sometimes. Um, that way everything comprises of three aspects of God for it to sustain. Yes. And what is the effect of meditation in daytime and nighttime? <laughs> I'm thinking the same thing. We'll talk about it next session. What is the effect of meditation in the daytime and the nighttime, which is good? According to the book, uh, the sunlight is good. So you can meditate on the beach in Copacabana. Oh. I don't know. I'll, we'll look at it. <laughs> we'll answer this question because we're going to come to it at least and finish off in the last part. Thank you, thank you. Link to Sriram session. I'm sorry, I'm not aware and of it's, this. The registration is closed already. It's only yeah. for Arctic Yogi, so I... Uh... It was supposed to be through your foundation. Uh, so if you haven't registered, you'll have to contact your foundation and figure out if you can still... What is that. happening to the nervous system of a highly sensitive person and what is happening to this person's subtle body? When you use the word sensitive, uh, we have to still see how the book deals with it. There is an answer for that. I don't want to give it prematurely. When you say the word sensitive, it depends because all the chakras are not the same size. And uh, that has a connection with your uh, em emotional body. Um, certain chakras has connections, as you know, with the emotional body. And that affects your emotional body. And what will affect your emotional body will affect your nervous system, making you more sensitive. Yeah. Are you done with that? Yeah. Okay. So someone here, it says, I don't know who this Redmi Pro. Yeah. So I don't know who it is. I'm unmuting you. Uh, so you can actually ask your question. You've put your hand up. Because it's Saturday, it's Friday night, she's putting her hand up or he's putting his hand up. No? Okay, fine. So that okay. was just... So shall we do the closing? Yeah, the we'll do the closing and we'll go. All right. Close your eyes. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grandmaster Chokoksu, to Lord Maha Guru Chineli. To all the great ones, to all the holy masters, all the great teachers, the great masters of theosophy, to the healing angels, healing ministers, the beings of knowledge, light and power, of communication and our respective Wi-Fi's. We thank you all for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your divine guidance. Thank you for all the priceless teachings being imparted to us today. Help us to continue to absorb and assimilate it, to have a clearer, deeper, understanding of the teachings. Thank you and in full faith, with gratitude, respect and love, we thank you. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy you your uh, weekend. We'll see you on Monday. See you tomorrow for the full moon of Gemini, those of you joining and uh, also on Sunday if you are. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Uh, Earth medium, no, the Earth's etheric body. Um, oh, okay. I know it. Should we end no, you have to first. No, no, no. Wait, oh, I no, no. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I've just stopped this. Bit. Okay, everybody, have a wonderful weekend. Atmanavaste.